So um, when uh, when uh, Kadi invited me to, to do this and said all of the members of the uh, executive committee need to give a talk, it was sort of, well, what do you talk about? And unfortunately, the idea of, of discussing the work that we do um, sort of came forward as the idea that, that, that made the most sense. So with, uh, with some apologies, most of us in the academy tend not to talk about ourselves very much publicly. We talk about others and where the issues are. I will, full disclosure, be talking about some of our work just so that you can put it into the context of, of some of these larger issues. So the, the, the title, Strategies for Addressing Society's Wicked Bioethics Problems, is as much a, an autobiographical uh, description of some of the challenging issues that those of us who work in bioethics focus on, but it's also a, a kind of an admission that I think for a lot of people in the sciences, they don't get what this bioethics thing is. They think it's either all about stem cells or all about euthanasia. And once you figure that out, you know, what, what's going on really? And I, I'm, my plan is to try and convince you a little bit that some of these issues are tough to deal with. Some of them are not so tough to deal with, but still require a lot of research. And at the end of the day, spoiler alert, the only way this is going to work is through collaboration and interdisciplinary collaboration. So to sort of start this, uh, let me remind you, if you had read the abstract, why I used the title that I did. There's a paper uh, now, if you go on uh, Google Scholar, has been cited 6,434 times. Would that we all would have our papers cited 6,434 times. Uh, Riddle and Weber's paper, two Berkeley, California uh, scholars, urban planners, not uh, bioethicists, not physicians, not clinicians, but planners who wrote a paper with one of probably the most boring titles you've ever heard, uh, Dilemmas in a General Theory of Planning, where, by the way, no references in this paper. This is 12 pages of text and argument not a footnote, not an endnote, anywhere, in which they go on at some length, I've given you the Reader's Digest version, in describing what is essentially the problem of our time. The problem of our time in the 1970s was how to address big problems. And what they realized was that for those who work in the policy uh, arena, uh, planners in particular, they were thinking about urban planners, but Quite frankly, it applied to anyone who works in, in social planning, be it in medicine, science, or the other, uh, faces a set of problems that they say are inherently different from the problems that scientists deal with. And they called these planning problems inherently wicked. Now, not wicked in the sense of uh, the, the play or, uh, or something evil or malevolent, but wicked as contrasted with Tame. Tame problems are the problems that these guys said, sci say that science works on. Problems that are solvable. Problems that are known. The example of how to get to checkmate in five moves was an example of what um, Riddle and Weber described as a tame problem. You know what the problem is. How do I get to checkmate? You learn the rules. You learn the game. Uh, and then you actually know when the problem is solved. So the two criteria for a tame problem is first, that you know what the problem is, and secondly, you know what it is to have solved it. So checkmate, no dispute, I take uh, your, uh, your king and the game is over. The same can be applied in other forms of science. Uh, we know that when we have fully sequenced a human genome, we know what the answer is. Um, we can go further and further, but science questions tend to be tame as contrasted with wicked. The example of wicked problems are now somewhat legendary. These screenshots just simply show you pictures. Where to build uh, a set of uh, highways is an example of a wicked problem. It's actually not even clear what the 
problem is. It's not just about geography, but lots and lots of, of issues arise from that. Or how do we solve the crime problem? Well, what actually is the crime problem? What's the best way of doing educational reform? Um, what's the best way of, of organizing our tax system? These are examples of wicked problems because, in fact, we may not even agree on what the problem is, nor on what it means to say that it has been solved. And you could go on and on. You could talk about employment. Full of what's the proper level of, empl of employment or unemployment uh, in society? Um, what's the best way of, of uh, encouraging the national defense? How about humanitarian aid? Uh, and what about science? These are examples of either big problems, we like to call them big problems, but that uh, Riddle and Weber described as wicked problems. I suspect that if we went around the room uh, today, we would get disagreements about what the, the real problem is in labor policy. Is it about employment or is it about poverty? Um, national defense, is that about trade policy or is it about national security? On and on. The examples, uh, once you finish the paper, which I encourage you to read and it will be on the uh, uh, the website, uh, make it fairly clear how public policy faces and has long faced uh, wicked problems. Now, the characteristics of wicked problems have been listed in this slide. There are 10 of them, the most obvious of which is that unlike tame problems, wicked problems don't have a definitive formulation. We don't even agree on what they are, and we don't even know whether they've actually worked. How do we know? Uh, whether we've answered the problem of employment or unemployment. We, we actually don't. We also realize, this is sort of a, um, a reference to von Heisenberg, that we're not even sure about what problems are um, and how we define them. In fact, the very defining of a problem raises lots of others. Uh, and not only that, when you're actually engaged in the process of, of trying to solve these problems, you yourself have a certain amount of moral responsibilities that arguably scientists don't necessarily have. I actually love the one, uh, does this have a, uh, this doesn't work when you point it out here, does it? How about this one? Well, it works. Um, notice the fourth, uh, the fourth criterion. Solutions to wicked problems aren't true or false. They're just good or bad, better or not so good. So what about bioethics? Are bioethics problems tame or wicked? Well, I put an iconic picture of the US versus Carl Brandt, one of the two main trials of the Nuremberg trials following uh, the Second World War, an infamous uh, case in bioethics history, a famous one in many ways, uh, and lots of introductory bioethics students learn about the Nuremberg trials. They learn about the horrific Nazi experiments. They learn about the Nuremberg code that came after uh, the Nuremberg trials. And some folks would say that bioethics problems tend to be of this form. There's some horrible thing that's happened. We all agree. Now we have to come up with a set of rules to prevent those bad things from happening. Tame in the sense of we know what the problem is. Never experiment on human beings without their consent. That's pretty easy. Now let's try and figure out what the solution is. Maybe uh, we, can, we can work on that. The field of bioethics in some ways emerged from those trials. There is argument about when bioethics started. But in a nutshell, there's certainly agreement that bioethics is in many ways a scientific discipline. It has a set of methods. It has a set of objectives. It's not simply a bunch of people with one hand and the other hand making uh, opinionated uh, uh, reflections without any, any uh, sort of methodologic rigor. So bioethics is this cluster of topics. Topics from uh, medical decisions to public policy, all of which are conducted in some form of interdisciplinary way. Uh, Bernice mentioned the Bioethics Commission. I've put a screenshot of one of the reports of that presidential commission, but you can see just by the 
uh, the screenshots here that bioethics has theories, it has methods, it has sets of principles that it uses, it has journals that are highly recommended, uh, that you wish you could get 6,487 citations to your papers in, and we have professional associations, some of the largest of any uh, professional organization. Uh, the bioethics community has a, a professional association that has several thousand members. So bioethics is systematic. It follows rules of science. It tries to prove things. It tries to develop ideas and test them. Many folks, I think, still think that bioethics focuses in this dilemmatic form, that you are fa always finding yourself either uh, between the so-called rock and the hard place or on the horns of the, of the dilemma that H.L. Uh, Mencken refers to. Uh, never a good place to be, and I think people mistakenly think that all of bioethics is the you have one heart and two patients, and you don't know which patient gets the heart. Well, it turns out that bioethics probably isn't just that. Uh, in fact, it spends an awful lot of time looking deeply at, at issues. My favorite one is probably the subject of informed consent, a well-known topic in bioethics. So well-known, in fact, I just went uh, to the uh, uh, NCBI uh, website yesterday, and you can see here that there are over 3,500 books written on the subject of informed consent, another 330,000 journal articles written on the subject of informed consent, a topic you all know about any time you've been into a hospital, agreed to participate in a, in a study, or designed a study, you have tried to create one of these documents. And in fact, for the last 40 years, bioethics has been virtually obsessed with nothing other than the subject of informed consent. So, shameless self-promotion for the work that we're doing up in Indianapolis, we too have contributed to the 330 uh, 800,839 articles, and this gives you just a, a, a Reader's Digest uh, tour of some of the work that we've done that shows how even in the field of bioethics, we've started to examine what I would call tame problems. You're just getting screenshots to show you the, the titles of papers. Here's a project that we've been working on with our colleagues in Kenya. Look at the, the, the detail here. This is a study of antiretroviral therapy dosing for children in West. So what kind of, of, uh, of medicines do we give to kids as opposed to adults to prevent HIV? And what do we do about consent? Kids are not allowed legally to give consent, either in Canada, Cameroon, Kenya. Their parents have to do so. They're allowed to give assent. Kids can say, no, thank you but they can only participate with the permission of a guardian or a parent. So we studied these issues in some detail, realized that the issues in the U.S. are different than the issues in Kenya. For example, in Kenya, women, adult women, cannot give consent to participate in research without the permission of the male head of household. And that male head of household may be their 14-year-old son if the dad is gone or dead. We've also looked at uh, Guthrie cards, the newborn uh, blood spots that every parent uh, has to uh, undergo the tragedy of. Of course, the kid himself doesn't realize when the needle stick goes in the heel, it's the parent. I was a parent practically fainting when daughters were getting their heel uh, stick to find out uh, what, kinds of, uh, what kinds of medical problems they may or may not have. It's a very common thing. We've collected these blood spots in Indiana for over 40 years. There are several million of them being kept at the state health department. But we wanted to know what uh, parents thought about using those dried blood spots for research. Should they give their consent? Should they not? We were interested in cancer researchers and cancer care and the fact that right now there are cancer hospitals all over the country, all over the world, that are collecting specimens tumor biopsies and the like from people who are themselves undergoing cancer treatment. We've created massive biobanks all over the world. Every continent on the planet has a biobank. 
Uh, even Antarctica has a biobank. The Danish government has been studying uh, extremophiles and uh, new bacteria. So there's no place on the planet that doesn't have a biobank. We wanted to know from the IU Simon Cancer Center whether those previously collected specimens used for diagnostic purposes could then be used for research. You'll notice that there's nothing that these four or five papers have in common except the topic of informed consent. Um, we've even been wondering whether consent, the old model of asking every person every time to get permission to do a study, is worthwhile. My colleague Tim Caulfield and I, uh, he's a lawyer from the University of Alberta, have called the question about whether we should do something a bit more broadly. Get consent for all kinds of research, not just that, that one study. Uh, my colleague Barbara Evans and I have done work on the legal aspects of informed consent. The FDA has very explicit rules about consent for genetics research, ironically and somewhat frustratingly, different from the rules that the NIH requires. Same federal agency, the Department of Health and Human Services, oversees the FDA and the NIH, two separate rules. That's a problem. You don't have to go to Kenya to have difficulty. It's happening right here uh, in the United States. And a screenshot, my colleague Peter Schwartz and I have been looking at the issue of how much information and in what form you should be giving patients who are about to undergo colonoscopy uh, in order to make an informed decision about whether they should have a colonoscopy, have a fit test, or the like. I could fill this with not 330,000 examples, but these are just over the last few years, we have been doing essentially the bioethics equivalent of mapping and sequencing the informed consent genome all the way down to this, this level. So I don't know whether you'd call those uh, tame bioethics problems or wicked ones, but people are certainly saying that there are wicked bioethics problems. No, no less than the now very well-respected physician Atul Gawande wrote in the New Yorker, uh, some, a beautiful title, Something Wicked This Way Comes. He's referring to Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, which may be on my list of a wicked problem. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Deciding how we allocate scarce resources in Ebola is another good example. Who should get what? And finally, the large area of genetic medicine, in particular pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine. So there's no shortage of, of topics. I'm using the rule of not putting too many colored pictures on a PowerPoint slide, but this is a little bit of an autobiographical history of my last 30 years. Uh, this is a, the top left is, of course, Louise Brown, the world's first test tube baby. The reason I got into bioethics was I had a science teacher in high school who said, why don't you study a topic? And this was 1978, so now you know how old I am. Louise Brown had not been born. At the end of class that year, Louise Brown was born. Oh my goodness, science moves in strange and mysterious ways. We could rhetorically discuss whether you think these are wicked or tame. You have uh, uh, Terry Schiavo in the middle there. That on the far right is Barney Clark, who received the world's first externally uh, driven artificial heart and was given actually the key to turn it off if he wished. The organ donor issue is massive. It's not limited to why is it that we have 75% uh, of Americans who support organ donation, and yet there is still 125,000 people waiting for organs right now in this country Two-thirds of them are waiting for kidneys. 7,000 people are going to die this year waiting for an organ. That's a wicked problem, if there ever was one. Of course, you know about Dolly. Uh, Dolly is interesting on a number of grounds, not the least of which is she's kind of a, a metaphor for science and technology. She was the 277th attempt to use somatic cell nuclear transfer to create an adult uh, mammal. Uh, so was it a good science project? Is it something we want to do in humans? Uh, today, driving down here with, uh, with my wife, we were listening to the BBC about um, an hour-long discussion of genetically modified organisms. That might be on your list for, for wicked. Stem cells, abortion tops everybody's list. 
Why? Because it's not solvable. We're not even sure what the problem is that needs solving. Remember the definition of, of wicked problems. We may think it's about choice. We may think it's about access. We may think it's about women's rights. We may think it's about constitutional protections. 23andMe is just an ex a good example of how genetics has become not only popular, but entertaining. So, Bernice mentioned big data. That might be on your list. How genomics might be used. That might be on your list. Um, my current favorite about what a bioethics wicked problem might be is improving population and public health. We all kind of agree, sort of, more or less, that it would be a good idea. But the devil's in the details. Here are some obvious details that I've uh, often shared um, somewhat embarrassingly about our great state of Indiana. Um, and again, I just, I, I'm lousy with PowerPoint, as you can tell. This is about the limit of my technical expertise. I tried to make this sign match the sign before it. That's the only reason why I've done that, and that's why there are five pieces of data that show what a wretched state we live in from the perspective of public health. I'm not even talking about our eugenic sterilization history or the Ku Klux Klan or anything else. I'm just talking about basic facts. We rank 37th out of 51 in overall health, 47th out of 51 in immunization rates, 43, sometimes it's 44 depending on how you count. It really doesn't matter. We're not in the top 25. Uh, we're not even in the top 35 infant mortality. These are all bad numbers. One is good, 51, because we include the District of Columbia, is bad. That's why I put an asterisk next to deaths from cardiovascular disease per 100,000. In this case, one is bad, 51st is good. And we're, of course, closer to the worse than we are to the better. So we already know what the facts are. This should be obvious. Let's address these problems. We aren't. We haven't. I don't know why we can't. Well, maybe I do. Why are bioethics problems wicked? Um, and here, uh, not just for colleagues like uh, uh, Professor Shapshay in front of me and the other philosophers, uh, whether you are official philosophers or just pretend philosophers, will appreciate that the next two or three slides are not so much about data, but about political and moral philosophy, which I think lie at the heart of understanding what bioethics can contribute to big problems and, and big challenges. Alistair McIntyre, um, uh, a Christian theologian, uh, wrote one of the most uh, penetrating uh, books of the 20th century uh, in which, among other things, he described abortion as probably the best example of an interminable moral debate. It will not be solved by data. It won't be solved by good arguments. Nobody wins that debate. It will go on, hence it is interminable and perhaps wicked. His rationale for why we have these kinds of problems is that we've actually lost our moral way. I'm not sure that I agree with McIntyre, but I sure like the sentiment. It now becomes so much about opinion and preference, and I think this and you think that. This is the risk I'm trying to avoid you putting bioethics uh, or describing bioethics uh, as, and that is we're just about expressions of preference. I prefer women having the right to choose. You don't. Oh, well, uh, that was McIntyre's critique. It's a very powerful critique, and you can strip away the theology. I think it's a really powerful critique on its own. The second is from my friend Zeke Emanuel. He of the famous Emanuel uh, Trio brothers, uh, he's the uh, the physician scientist. Ram, of course, is the uh, the mayor of Chicago, and Ari is the big agent in uh, in Hollywood. But Zeke was initially a PhD in political philosophy before he became a physician, and his PhD dissertation, which ended up becoming this book, does a lovely job of describing his view of why we can't solve uh, these moral problems. I've made it easy for you. I've put it in red at the bottom. We lack a common conception of the good. We don't agree on what the goals of society are. We may never have, but we pretend that we do. And I'm not even taking a political position on this, Republican or Democrat, liberal or, or conservative. The reason why medical ethical questions seem irresolvable may well in here, not in some defect of medical practice or the advent of new technology or the inherent complexity, but in our political philosophy. 
this is a really powerful statement. Um, with some uh, uh, modesty, uh, I have a, a good friend and a colleague, uh, a guy named Alessandro Blasime, who I met while I was on sabbatical in Toulouse. And we've been uh, experimenting with something as audacious as a new theory of science policy for the 21st century. Small little project. We've been testing it out in little pieces. Uh, he did. He presented this paper that we had written, uh, published in the European Journal of Human uh, Genetics, and we made a point similar to uh, Emmanuel's, but it was something a little bit more detailed. And that's not only that we don't have a conception of the common good, we don't even know how to talk to each other. We don't even know how to accommodate pluralistic views. We're not hoping for one univocal view uh, for society that everyone should become you know, secular humanists um, or social democrats, though that might be useful. Um, we just think that we haven't even figured this out, and I refer you to any of the current debates going on in Capitol Hill uh, right now. So enough with the diagnosis. I've got uh, two minutes left. Let's get to some problem solving. So there are a few ways of, of thinking about this. What's old is new again. If you thought that the Riddle and Weber paper was often cited, this paper, which I highly recommend, and if you haven't read it, I would suggest you do so now. As of yesterday, Garrett Hardin's paper, The Tragedy of the Commons, has been cited 24,611 times as of yesterday, in which he says, among other things, that our problems in solving big issues, and he selected in this case the population problem, what do we do with expanding population, is not, doesn't require and probably doesn't have a technical solution to it, although we could suggest a one baby policy or more contraception or lots of other things. The problem requires a new way of thinking about morality. Um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, once wrote a paper, the only paper he ever wrote that I uh, took issue with. Uh, Gould said, and, and among other things, that this is not such a hard problem. Science and, and ethics don't even have to worry about things uh, conflicting. Let science take care of the facts. Let ethics take care of the values. There isn't any overlap. He called it the non-overlapping magisteria issue. I disagree with Gould and have written a little bit about why I disagree. And in fact, in a nutshell, the reason that I disagree is we can't avoid the overlap. The very fact that the Indiana University Network Science Institute included, with great appreciation, Bernice, uh, people who work in, in ethics and law and, and science and technology, is that we have to talk together. We have to overlap. Uh, Harold Varmus said the same thing, the former director of the NIH and uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer uh, Institute. So let me close with a couple of, of uh, hopefully optimistic views. Some people are actually trying this out. The government of Australia wrote a paper called Tackling Wicked Problems, where they said, we're going to use complexity theory as a fundamental basis for how we solve some of these, these problems ourselves. They've been making some progress. The paper's online. Uh, I'm not saying they've solved everything, but they are uh, not just talking about it. They're actually working on it. Finally, the area of what I call translational science and the valley of death. This, of course, is all the rage, moving from bench to bedside, getting the ba basic scientists to talk to the clinicians. Uh, this is Declan Butler's cartoon from Nature from several years ago. We looked at this issue uh, as if it were a genomics problem. So we first wanted to map the translational science policy valley of death, and then we wanted to figure out a way across it. The valley of death has, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, pathway has lots of different valleys from discovery all the way to population health, each of which have different methods that we use. Each of them have different ethical issues that need to be addressed. And I'm happy to say that there's progress being made empirically uh, from a legal or jurisprudential perspective and from the social sciences to understand uh, these different steps. Um, so I'll close with these three, I think, hopefully uh, optimistic uh, strategies, all coming from this same paper. The first of it is that it may be time to rethink what we've often called the social contract, the, the relationship between science and society. 
Uh, it's not worked out all that well for some, uh, and for others it, it has, but we, uh, we probably need to revisit what some of the presumptions are about the nature of science and its connection uh, to society. We probably need to spend a bit more time working on building and maintaining public trust. This is a screenshot of a, a science policy forum that a group of us wrote a few years ago where we reminded people that if we let the genomic bubble inflate, uh, we may run into problems far greater uh, than not having sequenced uh, the genome in the first place. So we need to think about reducing hype about science progress, valuing the role that science should play in public policy generally. The European uh, Union has just fired its science advisor. Um, that bodes poorly uh, for the rest of the OECD and lots of other countries. And we need to think about ways of democratizing uh, science. Our group has been working in a, a much larger arena uh, where we've developed a collaboratory looking at ethical, legal, and social issues that goes beyond just the mapping and sequencing and figuring out ways uh, to collaborate more effectively. So I'll close with a, a, a sort of a, a helpful set of, of, uh, of quotes from the former science advisor, uh, Neil Lane, who himself was worried, this is from the, during the Bush administration, the fact that it was during the Bush administration is not the point. I think this still applies. He thinks that the way that we can apply new knowledge uh, for society's benefit will require an entirely new interdisciplinary approach that involves agile problem solving, uh, that, sci that involves science and technology partnering with business and the public policy environment that includes a recognition of the way that people and cultures from different societies interact, new methods of communication, and involves the kind of people that the Indiana University Network Science Institute is bringing together. So that's what we've been up to. Uh, you can follow us on, uh, on Twitter uh, or at our website, and uh, I'll let uh, Kati do her uh, version now. Thanks very much.